Good afternoon, everybody. I, I just knew they were going to play that song as I walked up. Um, I'm going to be joined by a bunch of friends uh, who are going to help discuss the subject of money. Okay, so uh, I hope that's a subject of interest for you. Um, but they don't have a money tree to allow you to pick from, I'm afraid, but uh, we hope we're going to come up with some solutions for you as we discuss money. Um, I'd be very pleased to introduce the whole panel. Scott Morris, uh, director from APRA. Uh, Lynette Pang from uh, Singapore Tourism Board and we've got Paulina Arkas from uh, the Music Export Finland and last but certainly not least Stuart Johnson from the Canadian Independent Music Association. Ladies and gentlemen, I think I've got the most attractive and handsome panel ever. <laughs> Do you not agree? Yeah. They don't agree. Silence. <laughs> Do you not agree? We paid him. Clear you. Yeah, yeah. yeah let's your mic's that. not on. That's what yeah, exactly. Is. Can you hear me at the back? <laughs> I won't be rude. Um, okay, so we have uh, 30 minutes. Although I see it says 23 minutes and 53 seconds, I think that's very unfair because we haven't started yet. So we do have 30 minutes uh, to have a discussion about how uh, friends and Romans and countrymen, <laughs> as I would say in my country, uh, would possibly help you when it comes to funding. Um, so I'm going to ask each one of them to really just first of all introduce. They've changed the timing now, they've given us 30 minutes, that's, that's cool. Uh, I'm just going to ask each one of them to sort of give an introduction about what they do. Um, and if I can start with Scott. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Graham. Thanks. Um, I'm uh, from an organisation called APRA AMCOS, which some of you might know. It's the um, collecting society for composers and publishers that covers Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific. And I'm here, I suppose, mostly because I'm channelling an organisation that we co-sponsor called Sounds Australia. So I'm channelling Millie Milgate, if you know her. She can't be here. She's um, preparing for the Aussie barbecue on Saturday. She's um, making the snags, or the sausages, I think, at the moment. But um, basically, APRA houses Sounds Australia, which is an initiative of the federal government um, and the Australia Council, which is the arts funding body, as well as all of the state music organisations, um, as well as the record companies and other sectors of the music industry. And I think the success of Sounds Australia, which actually coordinates all of the Australian presence at international showcases um, and, and organises um, export initiatives, for our members is due to the fact that it is really a very much an industry-led body. Um, so that's basically the introduction. And, and um, the Australian barbecue, how many bands are coming over this time? There's right? four bands, I think, coming over. Yeah? Yeah, cool. four or five, yeah. And there are a few of them actually on tonight right. at Clark Key cool. as well. So okay. get down there as well if you're well, not Moving on to bands, Saturday. you think you're going to take over Singapore this weekend. I think yes. this guy here has yeah, got uh, Canadian, a few yeah, bands a lot of coming into town. Um, but uh, Stuart, first time to Singapore? It is, yes. Welcome. Thank you. Um, SEMA, maybe you could give us a bit of an understanding of SEMA and what it's about. Yeah, SEMA is the Canadian, Canadian Independent Music Association, and we've been around for 35, 36 years. It's a non-profit association representing the independent music industry in Canada, so everyone that does not belong to the four majors. Uh, and it, it's, it's an industry association that represents the business infrastructure behind the music industry. So it's largely the, the labels, the managers, the publishers, um, some ancillary members, and uh, a small but growing base of artists as members. And we started off back in the 70s uh, primarily and exclusively as a, an advocacy body to, uh, to ensure the, that the regulations and the laws in Canada um, sort of uh, supported the cultural industries and the music industry in Canada. And as, as a result of that lobbying back in the 70s, we were successful in getting uh, Canadian content regulations embedded in, in our regulations so that it would ensure that at the time, 25%, but now 35% of um, music broadcast in Canada what had Canadian content. Now, what that did was spur the demand for, um, for that content. And so the, the laws came first that said we demand that we need 25, now 35% Canadian content. And then the funding started funding uh, coming after that. They realized, oh shit, we gotta, we gotta start paying for this, which was great. 
but in recent years, we've evolved from a, an advocacy organization to one that not only does advocacy and represents the interests of its members, but Canada does not have uh, an export office. So we sort of filled that void and we became the de facto export office as well. Uh, so we work with our partners, um, uh, Music Matters, Canadian Music Week, and, and many others to try and, and facilitate these opportunities for our business members and, of course, the artists. So that's what brings us to uh, Singapore. And you have, you have guys on the ground around the world as well. You don't just, it's not just in Canada. You have people around different parts of the world. That, that's exactly right. We have Nikki Chi here in, in Singapore. We have a, a gentleman in uh, Los Angeles. And we have someone else in, in London. And, and you know Shane. Uh, Shane works, uh, he's our UK Europe rep. So we've, uh, as an example, last year we did probably about 40 events in about 20 countries around wow. the world. And that's just scratching the surface. There's so much more that we can do uh, if we also had the resources uh, to do it. But that's where we're heading. We're going to be uh, building up that foundation. The Canadian's going to take over the world. We're trying every step you're of the working way. on it. Um, Lynette, yes. you haven't had far to come, have you? <laughs> no, no, 20 minutes from my home. 20 minutes from <laughs> your home, wow. Um, Lynette, maybe you could explain, obviously coming from a government agency, a little bit about what um, Singapore Tourism Board is doing and what they're doing with regards to, you know, trying to grow Singapore and, of course, from the funding aspect as well. Sure. Um, I think I'll take this in two parts. Um, why music for the Singapore Tourism Board? I think traveling is really about um, collecting experiences. And music is key to defining and shaping an experience. A room with no music is an empty room. A room with music, it's softer, it evokes a feeling. It gives a valuable experience. So that's how we see music in a more conceptual level. But I think music at the end of the day, from a government perspective, in terms of an industry, we're talking about economics. So when we're talking about economics, we're talking about not just looking at it from a tourism board perspective, because that would be you know, a very small part of the entire value chain. So um, where I come from, I work very closely with my friends and colleagues from across the government sector. So for example, um, I would work with the Media Development Authority. They drive digital music, they drive digital, and they look at local talent capability. Um, my friends at the Economic Development Board would be talking to a lot of you out here to ask, would you be interested to anchor your business here and to grow your business here and to work with the local companies? For the Singapore Tourism Board is how can I work with my colleagues who have anchored these bu businesses and who have grown these capabilities to curate and to put together experiences that will delight consumers who visit Singapore. So it's sort of a holistic um, experience. So th uh, because you're working closely with the other agencies, there are some, sometimes people will come to you and there's may maybe not a direct tourism benefit, but you won't close the door. It's about let's introduce another agency and work with other agencies. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Cool. Um, last but certainly not least, um, Paulina, welcome to Singapore again. Thank you. Um, the only formal export agency formal, very formal. in the panel, as we say. Um, Finland, <coughs> tell us a bit about the export um, office that you have there and what you're doing? Office sounds certainly very formal, but it's uh, Music Export Finland. It's an organization by the music industry for the music industry. We were first started by nine really um, foresight uh, companies that decided that, okay, we need to have a body that coordinates our, our missions and our work and, and, and works with the government to secure some funding and, and investment towards the music exports. And we worked for, together for two years, to, um, set really concrete goals, achieved them, and then the Finnish, entire Finnish music industry sort of got behind it. Our members are all the key trade associations, so it's Musicians Union, um, Composers Copyright Society, Neighboring Rights Society, IFPI, the Independents, uh, um, Light Composers Association, um, um, who am I forgetting? Uh, music Publishers Association. So it's they uh, basically form the body of Music Export Finland. They pay to have Music Export Finland. It's their investment. And because it's such a broad-based organization, so it's basically we can serve all Finnish music professionals, all the Finnish music companies. They need to be companies in order to be able to take part in our actions. In 2010, last year, we worked together with 325 Finnish companies. Uh, we had 40 t 43 different uh, productions, so to speak, or projects in uh, 14 different territories. And we basically divide our actions by 
first of all, sort of the international marketing communications or the international pr productions that we do. So that's uh, events like this. We came here with uh, 14 managers and agents, basically primarily to meet with live music industry here. So we had an off Music Matters event last uh, yesterday and another live um, networking event today with our with our companies and the, and the live companies that are here. So it's these kinds of events. Uh, it's also uh, the second part of our work is, is the domestic work that we do. So it's basically um, refining the knowledge of companies working in the sector because they are the ones that really know their business and the ones that are developing. So there's all kinds of refinery services for them. And then thirdly, we seek for investment from uh, various sources in the government, uh, mainly the Ministry of Education and uh, Culture and Ministry of Trade and Industry, to basically be able to uh, seek for investment for the investment that the companies are making. Where, where is the success, where are you seeing success as far as export? And which other countries are, are really sort of bubbling for you? It's uh, uh, where the money comes from. Uh, our uh, most important export markets there are Germany, uh, the Nordic Territory, uh, US, Japan, uh, in that order, actually. And then, uh, then is the, there's the other issue to which markets are Finnish companies going to invest in? What do they consider as, uh, as most important? Uh, GSA, all, uh, again, comes as the most important. But then Japan, uh, a lot of uh, other Asian territories that come as, as markets where they're going to invest in. Thanks, Paulina. Um, if I may then just move to another question for each one of you, which relates to what uh, aspects do you look for with regards to funding. And this may not necessarily be directly your organizations because, you know, like I said when I introduced you, you don't have limitless access to like funds. It's not like a money tree, as we say. Um, but maybe what you could do, if I can ask you first, Scott, is what are the sort of things that are being looked at? What's needed? Sure. Um, what, what should um, uh, bands and managers think about when, obviously, when it comes to funding? Well, the main funding in Australia, government funding in Australia for touring and for attending events like this, uh, export opportunities, is from the Australia Council and the federal government. And um, it is very competitive in terms of getting one of those International Pathways grants. Uh, there are also state agencies that, that also offer assistance in certain ways. And I think generally, yeah, it is very, very competitive. So what you look at are the, are the basic factors that the act has to be export ready, that it already has to have some sort of traction, and it has to have a business plan in terms of what it's looking for in those foreign markets. And I suppose from an Australian or an Australasian perspective, you know, we do look at Asia, and because they are developing markets, a lot of them, and sort of nascent music uh, e industries, that, you know, we're looking also at how we can assist, you know, that interchange. But I think, yeah, from a funding perspective from the Australian government and the uh, Australia Council, that they have pretty strict criteria and you have to really stand out to be able to, to convince the government that you're worthy of that and can then you know, show the results of that in terms of deals signed and, and how the strategy for that export will, will be played out. And I, you know, I think, uh, yeah, it, it, it is working quite well. The, currently, the the new government in Australia is, has announced that it is going to have a, a more comprehensive cultural policy now, which is good because we haven't had one properly in Australia since um, you know, the Keating government, I don't think. And there is an organisation called the Contemporary Music Working Group that a lot of organisations also feed policy in, and export is one of the principal pillars of that. Um, because I think you know, we're a very outward-looking country and because I suppose our repertoire has a lot of different genres that are, that are successful internationally, and we sort of do form part of the Anglo-American repertoire, for want of a better term to describe it, that, you know, there are opportunities there for us. And, and we're looking, in particular, to expand those opportunities in Asia and work gonna, with uh, Singapore, yeah, you I'm know. I'm just going to say Asia must be on the radar. Yeah. Uh, Austrade, which is part of the foreign affairs, also have... Um, we have an Australian music office in LA, but also Austrade offices in Tokyo and in Shanghai are, are very active now in yeah. terms of trying to assist acts, you know, um, uh, do business in those new... Well, I believe Char territories. Charles J. Tan, who's Singaporean, yeah. is from Australia. Yeah, he was from right. Singapore, yeah. but now in Australia. Well, so. yeah, in, in, the, in the region, there is so much interface both ways. Yeah. 
Uh, one of the events that we're now organising at APRA is uh, something called Sydney Song Summit, which has quite a large sort of uh, showcase um, element to it. And we're looking at how we can better also um, engage the region through the societies, actually. We um, funded through CSAC, the international body representing all of the collecting societies, um, some people from the Philippines to attend uh, with airfares and things like that to be able to have this experience of a week of doing songwriting and showcases and business workshops. So, you know, there are a lot of showcases in Australia also that are really, you know, important. I think the exchange of information and ideas about how to network the managers, the, the, uh, the events organisers, the venues, etc., is really important. We have a gr there's a great um, online resource actually that's been developed in Australia that you know would be great to expand throughout Asia, which would be really useful. Called um, Vroom, it was initially done by the New South Wales Music Office. I think it's just Vroom.com.au. V R O M M. Com.au, and that is an online resource that lists all of the venues, promoters, agents, what sort of uh, what sort of repertoire, you know, it, it's a really useful do-it-yourself sort of uh, tool yeah. for, for touring and researching the, the Australian market. Cool. Lynette, um, as a government agency, obviously, as you shared before, it's not just about Singapore Tourism Board, but what is it you think that the Singapore government is looking for when we see a very nascent, um, you know, music industry? What do you think, uh, what are the things that you're looking for um, as a country? I think it comes back to the industry. Um, you're right, it's, it's nascent to a certain extent. So what are the building blocks to bring it to the next level? So clearly when you're looking at industry development, you're looking at the core blocks would be capability development. How can a particular project or a certain initiative um, help develop the talent, whether it's ta well artists or backstage talent? Technological know-how. I think the other piece is how can a certain initiative or a project bring together um, leadership and um, talent from across the world to Singapore uh, so that there's a skills transfer. Other questions we ask ourselves, would, would this project profile Singapore in a particular way? Will it help jumpstart a new industry? Is it um, a, a project where we might want to risk take to incubate a new idea? Um, so that's on a very broad level, but I think in terms of um, when it comes down to certain strategies that at the Singapore Tourism Board that we look out for, um, clearly a few things. One would, of course, be the notion of a marketplace. So how can this event, well, for example, Music Matters. Music Matters is a great example of a marketplace where you have people from the digital space, the music space, um, talent, um, um, entrepreneurs coming together to exchange ideas, to discuss in Singapore, and perhaps something for Singapore will come out of it. The other thing that you know um, that's really on the top of um, our minds in terms of a nascent industry is how can we grow talents, um, in particular creative talents. So if a project's able to bring along the industry, it's able to talent spot and groom. That's something we're very interested in. So can those are some of the things we look at. Can yeah, I just point. comment on that? Yeah, sure. What I, uh, from what I hear, uh, uh, and as far as I understand, a great thing that would probably for the music industry here happen is that they would sort of get together, mm. uh, sort of whether it's the independent labels or whether it's the music entrepreneurs at large or whether it's the managements or the agents or, you know, sort of, uh, it can't be just the promoters. It's sort of the, it, the industry people here, for them to get together, for them to build a strategy and then come up with the, with the business plan for you of what kind of things they want to do. Yes, and, and I think that's what you've got rocking in fin Finland, and that's amazing. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, that is, in fact, sort of, for, for this whole issue, that is our sort of clear forte. It's, you know, it's such a small territory. We have 5.3 million people. It's, uh, you know, it's about roughly the same as Singapore, um, but, you know, half of New York or, you know, one third of, of any Chinese city or, or, or Tokyo. But it's, uh, it's because... There's been such a sort of investment into musical culture, that, you know, to musical education like anywhere else in the world. There's it's and, and there's, you know, really um, comprehensive uh, legislation to make sure that there's 
a healthy business environment for companies. So that sort of whole sec sector has developed. And because it is a small country, they've realized that they really have to come together. It's a, it's a land of, uh, it's a promised land of associations. You know, every sort of, you know, even just Finnish music startup, like technological companies for music, they have an association and 48 members. So it's, uh, they, they, they come together, they really unite their, their strength. And what's really our strength as an export organization is that uh, there are some like us all around the world, in all the Nordic countries, for example, and in the UK and in, in, in various different territories, but in none of them do they all come together around the same table. Yeah. I think we, so far, what I found out is the broadest representation of the entire industry. Sometimes it's rocky, I have to tell you, uh, but, it's, uh, but it's still, when we make a strategy of like, okay, this is what the companies are going to invest in, this is what they're going to do, this is what they need, this is what they need you to do, when we go with that to the government, they just go, brilliant. You know, we know that this is what's going to work because you're all going to work on it. And that we know that, you know, a bureaucrat doesn't want to make a mistake. So they know that when they do something with us, is that like the musicians union or the IFPR or something, somebody's going to come up and say, no, you did the wrong decision. Because they know that the entire music industry is behind it. So it's a it's bottom up yeah. type of thing. Yeah. Stuart, you want to make some comments about that? And what does, what you know, CIMA, what does the Canadian government look for? Uh, well, one good advice is don't suck. don't suck. Don't suck. And I'm being a little bit facetious, but yes, music matters, but good music matters more. Yeah. And that speaks to the criteria that Scott was talking about, because our government uh, funding it has similar criteria. You have to be export ready. I mean, you have to be ready to go to these markets. I mean, work on your craft domestically, tour the hell out of Canada or out of your region. But then when you want to go to export and look at other markets, then you have to have that maturity as an artist. And of course, that helps the companies and that, that uh, helps us export, export our culture and our, our, uh, our brand. Canada only has 34 million people. And so it's, it's a limited market in of itself. Yes, we're next door to the States. So we, uh, we try to exploit that market quite a bit. Uh, Europe is a, is a major market for us as well. Is the US the biggest market for you? Uh, for, for some acts, but yes, I think so. I mean, it, it's easy to get into the States for as a Canadian, it really Canadian is. Canadian bands rock in Finland. You know, yeah, they do, yes. Europe is a great market for you. Okay, uh, uh, there's a great hunger for Canadian music in Europe, and we're, we're trying to uh, take advantage of that as I'm much as possible. Yeah. You know, we're, we're th the 32nd largest country in terms of population, but we're seventh in terms of sale music sales. So we're, we're, we are punching above our weight. It is very big. Um, talking about that, you sort of started talking about a little bit of advice for artists and bands. Um, not only is what you look for as, as associations and agencies, um, wh what sort of advice would you give to the artist? And I think you touched on it very well about don't suck. I think that's a very good point. Um, but if I may ask all of you, and Scott, if you would give me, or give the, yeah. or give the rest of the audience uh, some sort of advice on how to approach the well, idea of funding. Well, the idea of funding, I think, you know, because in terms of the formal funding channels, it is quite formal and you have to tick all the boxes. So you really have to know where you're coming from. You have to get help, I would say, from organisations. There are organisations, of course, like the Australian uh, Independent Record Association, AIR, the record com indie record companies who are well represented here, I think, too, that, that can help with some of that, um, that, that preparation. But I think also, if you can look at other alternative ways, and I think, you know, the session with Imogen just shows you, you know, the power of social networking and doing research on the target markets and looking at the genre of music you are and trying to access music blogs in those territories to connect with people that, you know, probably would be interested in your music so you can actually get a buzz happening first. I mean, some of the... Imogen, I'm such a fan. She's just so Who amazing. Who is already? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, one of the things she did before the Sydney concert, for example, is, um, you know, apart from her video blogs and things, she, she put out to all her fans who were coming to the Sydney concert that um, you can determine the set list. You just vote for the songs that you want me to perform. And so the set list was entirely created just from the fans and they get some sort of ownership. You know, that's apart from, you know, the the video um, YouTube auditions that she does for her support band and things like that. But I think, yeah, now social networking is really important. 
Um, and the strategies, you know, we're, there, there's been quite a lot of discussion about that, how it has to be authentic and it really has to communicate directly to people who would be interested in the type of music that you perform. You know, I think that is, is really important. Um, well, yeah. that, that's key. I yeah, mean, it is you, key. you really yeah. have to do your homework and understand the market you want to go to and the kind of artist that you are and, 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 and where that will be yeah. translated in other markets. Uh, that's, that's why, it, for us, it's vital to have folks here, um, you know, Nikki here in Singapore and Joel in LA and Shane in, in London, because to they can back. talk about what's, what band is appropriate in what market. And quite often, bands will, will, uh, will want to say, tour the UK, and we talked about this before. And the UK is an incredibly difficult market to, to get into, one of, one of the most difficult. And so quite often our consultants and ourselves will say, well, you, you might want to stay from the, away from the UK and try this mark. Go to Germany instead or Scandinavia or somewhere. And um, uh, because money is so scarce, you're right, it doesn't grow on trees, uh, our companies have to be f very strategic in, uh, in, in how they apply that money. Sure. And the government funding, of course, looks to the, um, the sophistication of our members and, and our association in terms of where we, uh, where we want to put those resources. And um, as I said, you know, that's got very strict criteria. And we've got three national funding programs, one from the federal government, one a public-private partnership, and one a private fund uh, through, the, through the radio broadcasters. Um, so they look for very, they, they look for the return on investment. One yep. thing we talked about, Stuart, I think was this aspect of, of the romanticism of music. And, you know, that comes first, but what's missing is the next step. Um, you know, how, how do bands need to get away from that? You know, they've got to move, they've got to be romantic in wanting to be part of this industry, but it's all those other aspects they've got to, you know, consider. Well, I think they have to remember it's called show business. And they have to they have to understand that there is a business component and a strategic component to what they do. I mean, it, it, the bottom line is music, good music. Uh, that's what drives it clearly. Um, and you can be romantic to a point, but then pragmatism has to kick in, and you have to start using your brain and doing some homework about which markets you think will you'll be able to exploit better than others. Yeah. Paulina, advice for anyone looking for money? Well, because. Um uh, Stuart and Scott, you both touched upon like how and sort of concretely towards fans is the making uh, sort of the social media, making the fans and, and you can actually make them all around the world sort of with your partners and, and with your uh, um, uh, different, uh, well, different partners and, and different people that you're working with in each of the markets and sort of what you then need to do. So uh, I could approach it from the point of view that us in the music industry, we are just really crap with figures. We just, uh, it's, it shocks me all the time when I look at other industries, for example in Finland, it's how really incredibly organized they are in knowing exactly how much money has been spent towards them and what kind of, uh, uh, you know, what, what, um, um, what reasoning might there be to make an extra investment and so forth. And we really, uh, us at Music Export Finland, we really worked on our numbers of what exactly is the uh, um, revenue that we get from exports, what's the total market value of Finnish music exports, how much money is being put in into musical education, why does it make sense to actually seek to get some investment back at the sort of other end as in terms of, you know, in export money. Uh, what are the steps that are being done so far, what have they actually accomplished? Uh, sort of really creating the stats and analytics to really argue your case. It's, yeah, there's tons of romanticism in it, but it's the investors, whether it's the Ministry of Culture, whether it's the Treasury at the end of the day, they just look at numbers. Yeah. Of, uh, and for, for Finland at the moment, it's, we, we're a country that live, lives off exports. So yeah. we really have to argue a case that this is an investment that not only will bring cultural good and sort of uh, image to the country, but how much will it actually generate money now and how much could it generate in the future? And no. it's uh, yeah. it's that case that we really brought forward. And then we really have to follow it up. We really have to sort of, we've, we've been good at securing funding for, for, for international touring. Actually after, for example, after this trip, after all the um, managers and agents that they met with the international colleagues uh, you know, and, and partners here, if they managed to strike deals, if they managed to uh, get touring going, we managed to uh, argue for a case that there will be uh, specific funding for Asian touring. So for you to know, if you will be booking I Finnish tours, there will be some some support money for the for the travel costs and so forth. But it's uh, we have to make sure that uh, 
the investment does come back and that we really monitor it. Yeah. We actually have to like, okay, this mu how much money was put in, this how money how much money it generated. Yeah. It doesn't always end up, you know, we all know that it's a, it's a very, uh, the market um, test phase, the uh, market research, so to speak, is the single or the first tour. Yeah. So there are losses as well. But then again, at the end of the day, there needs to be enough uh, revenue at, you know, as a result for these investments to continue. I think numbers, numbers, numbers. I have to share my own experience of that. Obviously, applying for government funds here in Singapore. I used to be a graphic designer, and Illustrator used to be my number one application, but I'm, I'm a whiz in Excel now. I really know how to use Excel very well and cook numbers as creatively as I could graphic design. But it's actually a serious point, though, isn't it, Lene? I mean, the government asks for documentation to support your um, applications and everything, but your, your it's taxpayers' money at the end of the day. So for, for you, I mean, when it comes to advice, um, as our last point for the audience, what would you suggest uh, even an international organization here who has the potential of getting funding out of the Singapore government, what advice would you offer them? I, I would say um, there needs to be a very wonderful, delicate balance between the science and the art of, of music or a project or an initiative. So come to us, wow us with a concept, but tell us how it works. Wow us with a concept, but tell me how the business and the economics of it works. And I think one thing is the role of the government, the role of the state or public funding, it's not here to um, underwrite a business to develop talent. I think we're here to help you catalyze a business. So there's a very fine judgment call there. And I think the other thing that um, would be interesting to see more of would be a collective voice. I think the idea of an industry coming together as a group, um, making decisions and, and looking at strategies, I think that would be interesting and very powerful. For the industry, by the industry, not exactly. just by the government. Mm -hmm. Well, I do have to wrap up, but I just want to just quote one line from Paulina, actually. She said something earlier about the promised land of associations. Um, I'd like to say thank you to what I hope you might see as the promised panel of associations. So can you please put your hands together for this esteemed panel? Thank you very much. And it's now time for coffee, but I do believe that Dominique is going to come back on stage. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>